it's a great pleasure to see so many of you coming here to hear the Arbor Lecture but to be presented by John Milner. Before we start, let me say a few words about the Arbor Lecture. The organizing committee invite one of the former Arbor Laureates to present a one hour uh, uh, lecture here at the ICM uh, denoted the Arbor Lecture. This tradition was started four years ago in Hyderabad when Raghu Vairadhan gave the first Arbor Lecture. As we can see, this year's Arbor Lecture will be presented by John Milner. John Milner is one of the leading mathematicians of our time. He does not need a lot of introduction, but let me just say that he is one of a very small number of mathematicians to have received the Fields Medal, which he got in 1962, the Wolf Prize, which he received in 89, and the Abel Prize, which he received in 2011. We very much look forward to the talk. The floor is yours. Please give him a great welcome. happy to be here giving this talk in Korea. The, the field of topology is a, an enormous one, which has impacts in almost every part of mathematics. So I can't possibly do more than present a few highlights. And I decided the best thing to do was to pick one small part of one particular part of mathematics to concentrate on, namely the theory of low dimensional manifolds. So the plan of the talk will be the following. Uh, first, I will give a description of the, the time before topology. Why, why, why did it become necessary to invent topology? Then I will talk about the theory of surfaces, two dimensional manifolds, then the theory of three-dimensional manifolds. In the last part, we'll describe the theory of four-dimensional manifolds. So first, the prelude to topology. The first theorem, which is recognizably has a topological content, was produced by Euler in St. Petersburg. He was presented with the problem of how to take a walk in Königsberg, crossing all seven bridges without retracing his steps. And we represent this nowadays by a graph in which each of the four land masses is represented by a black dot, and each bridge is represented by a green line joining them. And he proved a very simple theorem that there is a path which traverses each edge exactly once if and only if there is most two odd vertices <coughs> where I'm calling a vertex odd if there are an odd number of edges coming into it. And as you see in this example, there are four odd vertices, therefore the problem is impossible. And if there's anyone here who hasn't seen this theorem, I, I recommend that they, they try to prove it. It's a marvelous elementary exercise. Well, that was the first hint of topology. The next hint came a little later in a different city, but by the same person. And this was his formula that for any convex polyhedron, the number of vertices minus the number of edges is equal to, plus the number of faces is always equal to two. So here's a typical example. If you think of this as a regular, as a regular, more or less regular polyhedron, then it has 60 vertices, 90 edges, and 32 faces giving us the magic number two. Well, Euler was well ahead of his time. It was more than 100 years, I think, before it was realized that uh, 
you didn't have to consider only convex polyhedra, you could consider any polyhedra made up of, say, any finite union of convex polyhedra, or more generally, any finite cell complex. And if you take the object and express it as a union of cells, then the number of even dimensional cells minus the number of odd dimensional cells is, is, an, is an interesting number, which you can check as invariant under if you subdivide the cells. But it took another 60 years or so before this was actually proved to be a topological invariant. The proof involved first expressing the Euler characteristic in terms of homology theory and then proving that homology theory is a topological invariant. So this is an enormously useful quantity. It occurs in many parts of topology. And it has one fundamental property which makes it easy to compute. If you have a cell complex, finite cell complex, which is a union of two subcomplexes, then if you just add the, this Euler characteristic of the two subcomplexes and then su subtract a correction term, namely the Euler characteristic of the intersection, then you get the Euler characteristic of the whole. So for example, if you have a, have a, a sphere represented as the union of two hemispheres, then you take the, the characteristic of the hemisphere plus the other hemisphere and subtract the characteristic of the sphere of one lower dimension and you can build it, make the computation inductively. Well, I think the first person who knowingly contributed to, to, a, to a fundamental part of topology was Augustin Cauchy who was the first one to give a precise definition of the concept of continuity, which is the cornerstone of topology. And he also introduced a fascinating topological invariant. You consider a, the plane punctured at point P and some curve which wanders around and comes back to itself. Then you find the winding number of the curve around the point P and computed, computed it by this marvelous analytic formula. And here I want to think of the right hands, the, the integrand as a holomorphic differential form. So D, dz over z minus P is, is, a holomorphic, is a differential form because of the dz and it's holomorphic because the denominator, the, 1 over z minus p is holomorphic everywhere in the punctured plane. And so the, this integral has the property that it, if you change the path a little bit, it doesn't change. So you get this, this marvelous analytic formula for a topological invariant. So this, from the very beginning, Topology has been tied up with analysis and, and it's turned out to be tied up with many other parts of mathematics. Well, the next person I want to talk about is the Niels Henrik Abel, the person this prize is named after, who didn't actually study topology in any way, but he was one of the people who made the study of topology necessary. So Abel was particularly interested in the integ integration of algebraic expressions like this. Now this may seem like a, something that belongs in a in an elementary calculus course, but it's not so elementary. So if you take the, the simplest case, uh, well, with n is equal to one, you can integrate it directly, it's no great problem. For n equals two, a typical expression would be the integral of dx over square root of one minus x squared, which 
The integral is well known. It's the arc sine function. But already when n is three or more, uh, it gets much more complicated. I guess the case n equals three was studied already by Euler. Uh, but I think Abel was the first one to look at larger values of n beyond three or four. Well, we describe this nowadays by looking at the smooth affine algebraic variety defined by the equation y squared is equal to the uh, f of x, where f of x is the function which we're taking the square root of above. So it's, of course, the, the, this terminology didn't exist then. I mean, people certainly studied such things, but they, we, they didn't have the notion of an algebraic variety in particular, or an algebraic curve. But it's easy to, one, it's easy to see that this uh, is actually a, uh, a smooth curve. It, it doesn't have any corners. It's, it's differentiable everywhere. You can use x as a local coordinate as long as uh, the non denominator y isn't zero. And if, the, if y is zero, then you can use y as a local coordinate. And so this expression, which you can write as dx over y, is what we call a holomorphic one form, or in other words, an abelian differential. Now, so this integral locally, if you, any, <coughs> if you start anywhere on this algebraic curve and choose a value of the integral at that point, then there's a, uh, well, you, there's an indefinite integral which is locally well-defined up to an additive constant. But the problem is that if you wander around a path and come back to where you start, then it will have a, a different value, off, usually, or often. So for example, suppose we start with the most primitive example, where y is 1 minus x squared. Or y, I'm sorry, y squared is 1 minus x squared. So this is just the equation of a circle, and there's a natural thing to, to integrate around the circle and in fact, the integral in the positive direction around the circle is minus two pi, as you can easily check. So that means this integral is defined only up to, uh, it's a multivalued function. It, it's defined up to two pi, or in other words, the inverse function is periodic of period two pi. So you can deduce already one of the basic properties of the sine function from this integral. And if you, now, if you look at the case where n is three or four, then the, the uh, corresponding complex variety is now a, a torus. So you can find two different paths around it and get two different integrals, which leads to the, if you go to the inverse function, it look, leads to the theories of doubly periodic functions. But if you take n larger than four, then you find that there, there are more paths, so the, uh, there's a great deal of ambiguity. We express this now by saying that for any closed loop on the variety V, we can integrate around the loop and get what we now call a homomorphism from the fundamental group built out of such loops to the complex numbers. Well, Abel had no Well, the language for describing such things didn't exist in his day. And uh, Abel himself died extremely young, so he didn't have the, the time to, to work out the theory. So the, the first person to really make some beginning at understanding what we now call the topology associated with this problem was Riemann. <coughs> 
So Riemann introduced what we now call a Riemann surface by starting with a, a function on a piece of the complex plane and then analytic, analytically continuing it and following what happened. He described, this is his exa a, a picture from Riemann's paper of a simply connected region in the plane. And by simply connected, he meant that if you take any cross cut, any path across the region from boundary to boundary, then it would separate it. And here is this example of a doubly connected region, meaning that you can, in this case, you can draw one cross cut without separating it. But if you do, do draw two cross cuts, then you'll, you will separate it. You can't, it'll divide it into two different regions. And this is an example of a triply connected region where you need three cross cuts to separate it. And he gave also a different region because remember he was not considering only subsets of the plane but things that you could build up over the plane. So in this case, it's a region where you can think of it having a overpass and an underpass where so one part of it crosses over another. And this, in his terminology, has a different topology, but in his terminology, it's also a triply connected region. Then he went on to consider closed surfaces. So he described a procedure for cutting F, cutting, taking a closed surface, a closed Riemann surface, up along a number of simple closed curves which intersect in just one point so that the, when you cut it open, you get a simply connected surface. So here's a picture of this. This is what we now call a surface of genus two. And on it, I've drawn four loops all passing through this point, the orange loop, the blue one, the green one, and the purple one, they're all they don't intersect except at this point. Notice the two of them go around behind so that I've indicated this by dotted lines. And if you cut it open, you get an octagon where the various sides are identified in pairs according to the same coloring. So he, show, he showed that the number of such curves is always an even number and this this number P, so half the number of curves you need, is an invariant which we now know is called the, the genus of, this, of the surface F. And 2P is also an important number which is now known as the first Betty number of the surface F. Well, this was a tremendous gap, taking a, a, a missing subject and and uh, filling it with a, a deep theory. Now, I must admit that I find Riemann very hard to read. I find his pre presentation confusing, but on the other hand, he, he was inventing all of this and for the first time, so it's, uh, and he did an amazingly good job and influenced, has influenced mathematics ever since. The presentation I like, it was given just a few years later by Möbius. So, Möbius first of all gave a, a, a simpler definition of this invariant. He defined the class of a closed surface as the smallest number n such that any n <clears throat> any end dis, uh, disjoint loops necessarily disconnect the surface. Or another way of putting this is that we can choose n minus one closed loops which do not disconnect the surface, but then if you add one more, it will always disconnect it. And this number p equals n minus one is exactly the same as Riemann's invariant, now called the genus. So here's an example with p equals one, a torus. If you 
chop this across with an ax, you can cut it along one circle without disconnecting it. But then if you take any other closed loop, it will necessarily disconnect it. And here's the theorem that Mobius proved. Any, if you have any two closed surfaces of the same class, then they're elementarily related. Well, I will give you, I will show you what his definition of elementarily related is, but I think in modern terminology what he wanted to say is that the two surfaces are C1 diffeomorphic. So this is a definition which applies to smooth surfaces, and he wanted to say that if, if they say have the same invariant of the class or equivalently of P, which is N minus one, then they're C1 diffeomorphic. Well, let me give you Mobius's theorem. I think this illustrates the problem in start, beginning the field of topology. I mean, this is clearly something you want to define. What does it mean when two objects are the same? And his attempt to define this looks very archaic to me. I don't know whether you agree with that what he's defining is C1 diffeomorphism, but that's, I think, the best interpretation of what it means. So the definition was very archa archaic. On the other hand, his proof was marvelous. It was a proof by what we now call Morse theory. So this is his picture of taking a, he, he was considering sur surfaces, smooth surfaces embedded in Euclidean three space. And he cut them into simpler pieces by horizontal planes. And well, you, if you take an arbitrary surface and do this, it may, you may get something complicated, but if you just tilt it a little bit in general position, then you will get a picture like this and choose the planes appropriately. So if you do this, then you'll find that each of the resulting connected pieces is a connected bit of surface which has either one, two, or three boundary curves. So for in the picture, if you look, start at the top, the cap on the top is an example of a surface with one boundary curve, which I'll, I'll speak of as a two cell. If you start from the top and take the next one down, this is a cylinder or, or annulus, which is a piece of surface with two boundary curves. And the next one down is a piece of surface with three boundary curves. The common name for this nowadays is a pair of pants. And if you look around the picture, you'll see that all of the other pieces fit into one of these three categories. Well, let me just adopt some notation for these things. I'll use the notion E sub K for an elementary piece obtained by taking the two-dimensional sphere and taking a region in it with, uh, with K holes. So, so if you just take, knock one hole out of a sphere, you get a, you get a disk, say, for each region, I'll call it E1. If you knock two holes, you get an annulus, E2. If you knock three out, you get an, a pair of pants, E3, and you can continue. I don't have popular names for the rest, but the EK still makes sense. So what the Mobius construction does is takes any surface and splits it as a union of these copies of these elementary pieces, E1, E2, or E3, which meet only along, which are to be identified along boundary curves. That is, if you want to reconstruct, you get a picture like this after you've cut the thing up. The, the bottom picture shows a typical, or a, one of the simplest examples of what you might get after cutting a surface up like this. And if you want to reconstruct the original surface, we just need to identify each boundary curve of E with some other boundary curve under a prescribed diffeomorphism. And I've tried to indicate this by coloring the boundary curves in pairs. So 
and by putting an arrow on it to indicate which way they're supposed to be matched up. So if you take this figure and, for example, identify the green curve with the other green curve matching the arrows and put it all together, then you'll get a closed surface. And in this case, you can sort of see what it is because you can visualize how to put these things back together. For example, you take the little disk with black boundary on the right. You can just slide that over to fill the hole in the next, in the neighboring picture. Similarly, if you take the disk with a red boundary on the left, you can slide it over to fill the hole. And now instead of having four components, you'll have just two components. And you've also cut down the number of boundary curves. And now one more step, you take the whole region with a blue boundary and shrink it down a little bit and slide it over and fit it in. Then you'll have, you'll got, reduce the thing to a connected set with just two boundary curves, which have to be identified. Well, more generally, you can do the same thing. So I need the lemma, uh, the following lemma. If you take two of these elementary pieces and identify a boundary curve of one with the boundary curve of the other, then you've got another elementary piece where the number of boundary curves clearly has to be k plus l minus two because you have a start with the boundary curves of the ek and the boundary curves of el, but you've pasted two together, so you've gotten rid of two boundary curves. So it's clear that the number of boundary curves is determined, and it's easy to, to see that this union is also an, an elementary piece which can be embedded in the sphere. For example, you take uh, EK and take the distinguished boundary curve, the one you want to glue together, and stretch the thing so it fits, fits over the equator. And say put EK in the northern hemisphere. And similarly, you can take EL and stretch the distinguished boundary curve so it fits in the equator and put EL in the southern hemisphere. And then the union is embedded as a example of E k plus L minus two. So you just simplified the thing inductively when identifying one boundary curve with another and after n minus one such identifications, you get a connected set. <coughs> and so it'll be E sub k for some new k. And since the, we've all had an even number of boundary curves at every point, this will be an elementary set of the form E2p. And this p is again Riemann's invariant. Now, we have to take a sphere with an even number of holes in it and identify the holes in pairs. And as an example, when p equals three, uh, each pair that you identify, you can think of as sticking a handle onto the sphere <coughs> and you're finished. One comment here, uh, notice that uh, Mobius was only considering orientable surfaces because he was considering a surface which is embedded in three space and that is necessarily orientable. Uh, you could apply Morse theory also to, uh, to an unorientable surface even though it doesn't embed in three space but then you'd have to, you'd, you'd need one extra kind of elementary piece with a, a non-orientable piece and their argument would become more complicated but I'm sure it could be carried out. I know, Mobius had invented the Mobius band by this time, so he certainly was aware of non-orientable surfaces, but uh, he didn't try to consider them. Well, the next person I want to consider is not so well known, but I think there are two important contributions that I want to point out. I think he was the first one to give a clear definition of what to topology is. It's the study of properties of a space which are invariant under continuous functions with continuous inverse. <coughs> 
So it may be that someone else had done, said, made this definition before him, but that's the first record that I know of. And this is a marvelously simple definition. We can modify it to co cover many other things. We, if we instead require the, uh, consider piecewise linear functions with piecewise linear inverse, then we'd have the com concept of piecewise linear topology. If we talked about differentiable functions with differentiable inverse, we'd have the subject of differential topology. So this simple definition really enables one to focus the mind and know what one is talking about. Another thing which von Dick did was to formulate, take the gauss binet theorem and formulate it as a global theorem. Now, many years earlier, Gauss and then Binet had given a simple formula relating curvature of a piece of surface with a curvature of its boundary. But what, as far as I know, no one had pointed out before was that if you cover the manifold with such small pieces, then the ter boundary terms all cancel out and you get something depending only on the topology of the manifold. Namely, you get this marvelous formula that the Euler characteristic is the integral over the surface of Gaussian curvature with respect to area divided by two pi. So this has been an this formula has been an inspiration over sen ever since. It tells us that there's an intimate connection between the curvature properties in the small and global topology represented by the Euler characteristic. In particular, Suppose that you can find a metric with constant curvature, or, or not, it doesn't have to be constant, a, cur a metric with curvature of constant sign. If it's always, curvature is always positive, then the Euler characteristic is positive. If the curvature is identically zero, then the Euler characteristic is zero, and so on. So there's an intimate connection between geometry and topology. Well, the towering figure in the topology in the 19th century was Poincaré, who did so many things. He just defined the concept of homology, Betty numbers, Poincaré duality, homotopy, the fundamental group, covering spaces, uniformization. Uh, a, Well, again, his definitions were not always up to modern standards, but he, he did a tremendous amount of laying groundwork for what one should be talking about. I want to, particularly, since I'm, this, I'm talking now about surfaces, I want to particularly emphasize this last part, uniformization. Now, this was proved by Poincaré, but at the same time by Kuba in Berlin. And I, uh, let me give Kuba credit because I think his, it's generally agreed that his presentation was much clearer. So here's the universe, here is the statement of the, univer, of, a, of, of the uniformization theorem. Suppose you take an arbitrary Riemann surface, right, or in modern terminology, a, a complex manifold, connected complex manifold of complex dimension one. Then its universal covering space is one of three objects. It's either the whole Riemann sphere, or the complex plane, or else the open unit, it's, it's uh, analytically diffeomorphic to the open unit disk in the complex plane. And an immediate corollary is that any closed Riemann, or any Riemann surface, closed or not, has a metric of constant curvature. Well, in the case of the Riemann sphere, that's, it's obvious that it, the sphere has a metric of constant curvature. In the complex plane, that's obvious for the, for the universal covering. 
but then you look at the original surface as the universal covering modulo a group of, of uh, conformal automorphisms with that, which must be fixed point free and the only conformal automorphisms of the plane without fixed points are translations. So you see that any, any Riemann surface which has C as universal covering must be a torus. And the torus obviously has a, if you see it, look at it this way, obviously has a metric of curvature zero. And the open unit disk is less obvious, but the, if you look at conformal, conformal unit, automorphisms of the disk, they uh, preserve a metric of constant curvature. And so you get a metric which is plus one, you can take to be plus one in the first case, zero in the second case, and minus one for any surface, for any curve of higher genus. So this is a concrete illustration, of course, of the Gauss-Binet theorem. Well, I'll conclude my discussion of surfaces by referring to this book by Hermann Weil, which is the first one which gave a clear definition of what a Riemann surface actually is. So he, he, he described Riemann surfaces in terms of a covering by coordinate charts, using overlapping coordinate charts and transformations between them. <clears throat> this is the first time that one had, had a really clear definition and it's a method which has been applied over and over again in modern mathematics. It's made possible definitions of things like smooth manifold, complex manifold, and so on. So he, may, he only carried the work out in this specific case of a Riemann surface, but the, the method clearly generalized. Well, this is 100 years ago, and I said this is the end of my discussion of surfaces. It, it's certainly not the end of the subject, which has been a very important uh, development in many ways over the remaining 100 years. And I think to prove its importance, I just need to mention that of the four Fields Medal that have been awarded to this Congress, two of them were for work on Riemann surfaces or algebraic curves. So the subject is far from closed. So I want to go on to three-dimensional manifolds now. So, well, the first paper I want to refer to is the thesis of Poul Hagard in Copenhagen. He proved the following. Any closed oriented three manifold can be decomposed as a union of two handle bodies of the same genus, which intersect only along their boundaries. So, well, I've, I've used this picture before to indicate a surface of genus three, but now I want to think, use it as a picture of a handle body, which is just the region enclosed by this surface. So if we take two of these things, and glue them together by some diffeomorphism from the boundary on the left to the boundary on the right, <coughs> then we'll get a, cl a closed three manifold. And his theorem is that if we're willing to work with handle bodies of arbitrary genus, then we can get an arbitrarily, arbitrary closed oriented three manifold in this way. Well, I think is. I think uh, people in Copenhagen at the time were not much impressed with this. They thought it was a rather silly result and not good for anything. But in fact, it's very hard to study three manifolds and this turned out to be one of the main methods which were used in subsequent years to try to understand three manifolds. Now it's not an easy t tool to use because we have, we have, the handle body is easy enough to understand, but we have to look at an arbitrary diffeomorphism from the boundary of one handle body to the boundary of the other. And this introduced a, an important subject in the theory of, of surfaces. How do you study the general 
uh, diffeomorphism or homeomorphism, whatever, from one to another, from, from a surface to itself. You've got a very complicated group, which has been, well, you can look at, at it up to homotopy or up to isotopy, but it's, it's become a, a very important subject. Now, I am being, being a little careless here. I'm assuming he was talking about smooth manifolds. Now, I've never seen his thesis. In any case, I don't read Danish, so I wouldn't get much out of it if I saw it. But I suspect that he was really talking about piecewise linear manifolds. But the, the theory goes through in either case and uh, has been an important tool. OK, I'm back to Poincaré. Uh, it's impossible to talk about three manifolds without mentioning his fundamental question. You consider a closed three manifold, and his first conjecture was that if it had the homology of a sphere, then it must be the standard sphere. But then he found a counterexample. That's something with the homology of a sphere, but with a non-trivial fundamental group. So we altered the connection to, altered the statement to asking whether if the fundamental group is trivial, does it follow that it's homeomorphic to the standard sphere? And this question drove topologists crazy for 100 years. There were many, many attempts to solve it, but they, for 100 years, every proof seemed to break down somehow. Well, this is the first case of somebody, to, a mathematician that I actually met. This was Helmut Knazer, who considered connected oriented piecewise linear three manifolds and noticed that any two have a well defined connected sum. So if we take two three manifolds, I, I've drawn a two dimensional picture, but, but uh, you should think of three dimensions. You cut a little hole in each and paste them together and you get the connected sum. And his theorem, oh, well, let's see, I need to go further. Notice the, the sphere is the identity element for this composition operation. If you cut a hole in a sphere, cut a hole in another manifold and paste, in, paste them together, then the rest of the sphere fills in the hole and you get the manifold you started with. Now, call a manifold prime if this is the only way you can express it as a sum. So if you express it as a connected sum, then neither sum n can be the sphere. And his theorem is that every compact manifold is isomorphic to a connected sum of prime three manifolds. Now, at first glance, this may look like a triviality because by definition, if it's not prime, then it's a sum of two manifolds. and then. You take each of those, express it as a sum of primes, and keep going. But it's not at all clear that this procedure ever stops. Maybe you, you keep expressing it ad infinitum as a sum of more and more components without ever coming to a stop. So it, he took a very clever argument to, to show that this procedure really does stop after a finite number of steps. Well, this theorem was proved before I was born, but 50 years ago, I was very happy to add a compliment to it, showing that the, uh, these prime sum ends are unique up to orientation preserving piecewise linear homeomorphism and up to order. The order clearly doesn't matter because the connected sum is a commutative operation up to isomorphism. Again, isomorphism means orientation preserving piecewise linear homeomorphism. So this is at least one step towards understanding three manifolds. But it's enough to understand the prime three manifolds, then you'll have a complete classification. Well, the next step was again someone I knew in some sense. Papakaryakopoulos and I were both at Princeton at the same time, and we certainly knew each other. 
I don't remember ever having a conversation with him. Uh, he was a very quiet person who worked by himself, and I was pretty quiet myself. But uh, he's, uh, he's an example of someone who sort of hid in the woodwork, concentrating on a very difficult problem, working on it for years without talking to much of anyone with it until he finally solved it. Well, this accomplishment was a proof of what's called Dane's Lemma. It's the following theorem. If you have a piecewise linear map F from the closed two disk into Euclidean three space, such that all singularities are in the interior in the sense that, uh, that uh, if you have two points which map to the, two points of the disk which map to the same point, then neither one can be in the boundary or near the boundary. Just with this hypothesis, the conclusion was that F is, uh, F can be a piecewise linear embedding which coincides exactly with F near the boundary. So you can remove the singularities where the thing crosses itself, but uh, without affecting what happens near the boundary. Now, it's called Dane's Lemma because uh, Dane had pub published a proof many years earlier, but in fact, Dane's proof was just wrong. It, he, uh, he, he, he missed a key point and there was, it seemed to be no way of fixing it. So it took uh, many years and much hard work by Papakiriakopoulos to uh, produce a proof. This theorem has, this lemma has one, impo one important corollary. Suppose that you take a s simple closed curve in three space, that is a, sim a piecewise linear simple closed curve. Then it's unknotted if and only if the fundamental group of its complement is a free cyclic group. So this was was uh, very exciting because it was reminiscent of the Poincaré conjecture. You're starting with a hypothesis about the fundamental group and proving a, fa a fairly explicit theorem about the topology. Now, let me briefly describe his method. He, uh, well, you, you, you have the, a map of the disk, so the image is some piecewise linear complex, which is not a disk, may have complicated singularities, but you can fatten it up a little bit, take a neighborhood. If the boundary of this neighborhood has genus zero, then you, the proof is easy. You take part of, the, part of the boundary and use it to fill in the disk. If it's not of genus zero, then he took a covering space, noted that the disk, map of the disk into this neighborhood could be lifted to the covering space <coughs> and proceeded inductively. If, if, uh, if in that case a small neighborhood it was, had boundary of genus zero, then you were finished. If it didn't, you could take, pass to another covering space. And what he showed was that the singularity got simpler at every stage so that the procedure had to stop after a finite number of steps. And he also uh, he also proved other important theorems by this: the sphere theorem, the loop theorem, using the same technique. But I think I'm running short of time and have to keep moving. Well, the next important step was a rigidity theorem of Mostow that a closed manifold of curv constant negative curvature is uniquely determined up to isometry by its fundamental group. So this was an amazing result. It said that if you just know that the manifold is a metric of negative curvature and know the fundamental group, then you know the manifold precisely, not only up to topology, but up to isometry. So and this was soon after extended to uh, 
manifold, complete manifolds of finite volume. So as a corollary, the volume of such a manifold is a topological invariant. Now this is a completely new kind of topological invariant because it can be an arbitrary, apparently an arbitrary positive real number. And there's an open problem connected with this. One would like to know the number theoretic properties of these numbers. For example, given two such manifolds, under what circumstance will it happen often that the ratio of their volumes is a rational number? In the case of surfaces, the volumes of hyperbolic manifolds are always uh, integer multiples of the, uh, of the, the area is an in integral multiple of the area of the two sphere. So you, the ratios are always rational, but, and in the case of a three manifold, if one, the two manifolds have a common covering manifold, then the ratio must be rational because if you take an n-fold covering, the volume gets multiplied by n. But in fact, these numbers are very mysterious and it's, hard to know exactly what their number theoretic properties are, and the same goes for the ratio of two of them. Well, here's an important example. Suppose you take a figure eight knot in the three sphere and look at its complement. Then Riley and Jurgensen showed that the complement can be given the structure of a complete hyperbolic manifold of finite volume. And Thurston found many more such examples of knots which, whose complements were hyperbolic. And in this particular example, he computed the volume by triangulating it into two regular ideal three simplexes. By an ideal three simplex, I mean a, a, a simplex in the hyperbolic space with all of its vertices at infinity. <coughs> and the Volumes of simplexes in hyperbolic space had been studied intensively already from the time of Lobachevsky. So this particular example, you can compute it as a log sine integral. Well, Thurston went on to prove much more about volumes of hyperbolic three, three manifolds. He showed they form a well-ordered set. That is, any non-empty subset is the smallest element. So you can have increasing sequences, but no decreasing infinite sequences. And he proved that the volume determined the manifold up to a finite number of choices. And now if, if you have a non-compact manifold, it will have a certain number of ends. These are kind of spikes going off to infinity. And if you take the volume of a manifold with k ends, it's an increasing limit of volumes of manifolds with k minus one ends. And the idea is you can show that each end is just, it has to, it has to be, be infinitely long because it's a complete manifold and non-compact, but it, ha has to sh the, the, it has to get very narrow as you go out to infinity since it has volume, finite volume. And you, can show that this is the only possibility. And then what you can do is just chop off such an end, getting a manifold with S1 cross S1 as boundary, and then you can fill in this S1 cross S1 with a solid torus. And you can do this in infinitely, infinitely many different ways. And what he proved was that all but a finite number of these manifolds you get in this way are hyperbolic and that they're uh, they're uh, in the limit, their volumes tend to the volume that you started with. So here's an example. You here, take the whitehead link. So this, think of this as a subset of the three sphere. If you remove it, you get a hyperbolic manifold with two ends. There's a red end and a blue end. And for example, if you take this red uh, so, uh, torus as indicated, you can fill it in with a solid torus in many different ways. One way would be just to fill it in by the obvious solid torus, which lies in, in, in three space. That would amount to just erasing the red curve. And that would uh, give you something which uh, 
is certainly not hyperbolic. But most ways, he showed that what you get would be hyperbolic and with volume tending towards the volume of the, this complement. Well, a slight digression, let me point out that this particular link is not really just a 20th century invention. Uh, a thousand years ago, here's a relic from a Viking grave with a beautiful example of a whitehead link. But in any case, I think uh, Thurston's work was not influenced by this. So he just, or Whitehead. Whitehead discovered it independently. Well, now I mentioned that, that uh, Knazer shows how to simplify a three manifold by cutting it along three spheres, breaking it into a connected sum. Jake O'Shalen and Johansson generalize this by showing that you, if you also allow cutting along tori, then you can develop a very interesting theory which cuts the manifold into simpler pieces and enables you to say a lot about it. Thurston pushed this much further, with a conjecture at least. He conjectured that every smooth closed three manifold could be decomposed by embedded spheres and tori into manifolds, each of which has a geometric structure. And by this he meant <coughs> that it had a Riemannian metric, which is locally homogeneous, so the universal covering would be a homogeneous Riemannian manifold, one which has an isometry carrying any point to any other. And, and there were just eight possibilities for this universal covering. So you remember surfaces, any, any closed surface has a geometric structure with one of just three possible geometries, positive, zero, or negative curvature. In the uh, case of three manifolds, you had to first cut it up by spheres and tori, and then there were eight possible geometries, but everything could be explained in terms of geometry. So the, there was the sphere, there was the Euclidean space, or the hyperbolic space, which are the first three uh, possibilities. And then there's two easy examples. Uh, so our, the line crossed the sphere, the line crossed the hyperbolic space, and then there are three examples associated with Lie groups. Uh, so I seem to be using up much more time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what, how should I proceed? You're doing fine, just go on. We enjoy it, you just go on. Just go on. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> okay, but let me amend that. If anyone doesn't agree there, they should feel free to leave. Okay, so there are, well, th this was a very explicit conjecture. Thurston was able to prove this in many cases, but the, in the most interesting general cases, uh, it w didn't work until Perelman came along. The, so the, the hardest cases being the case of constant positive curvature and constant negative curvature. The case of constant positive curvature would be enough to imply the Poincaré conjecture. Well, Perelman proved this, including the Poincaré conjecture, by a very difficult argument. He used a simple differential equation, which was first studied by Hamilton. Here, GJK is the metric tensor of the manifold. He, he assumed we were working with smooth manifolds with a Riemannian metric. 
and RJK is the Ricci tensor measuring curvature, and you simply uh, vary the, the metric tensor with time according to this differential equation, so that if, if there's a, a lot of curvature, then you're changing the metric very fast. If you're in a flat place, then you don't change it at all. So this, in principle, this is something like a heat equation. In the heat equation, you have heat tr spread over somebody, and if you just let it alone, the, the hotter places tend to become colder, and the colder places tend to become hotter until the heat is evenly distributed, assuming you start with a connected body. And in some, in some sense, this behaves similarly, so you expect that if you start with a, a lot of curvature in some places, very little curvature in others, the curvature will spread out and try to become even. But the problem is that it doesn't work so easily. You get drastic singularities. In fact, you can expect this from Thurston's conjecture because if you, uh, for example, if you have a two-sphere separating a part of positive curvature and a part of negative curvature, what is the equation supposed to do there? It has to blow up in some way. And sim similarly, if you have to cut along a torus, something has to go wrong. So what Perelman had to do was analyze all possible singularities and show how to eliminate them by some form of surgery or some form of simplification so you could prove the entire theorem. And this was a monumental achievement. Now, Perelman, I mentioned that Papakariokopoulos was someone who just worked by himself, uh, not talking much to anyone and proving until he'd proved a marvelous theorem. This is a, certainly a similar case. But uh, Perelman, of course, is unusual in other ways. He was he very shy about this and was insulted that people wanted to reward him by giving prizes for just doing what he loved to do, refused to accept them. So uh, in any case, he's different from most of us. <laughs> okay, so I should say something about four-dimensional manifolds. I'll start with rather an unsettling comment. So remember the last slide was in uh, St. Petersburg a few years ago. This is in St. Peter's, well, in the same city 50 years earlier with a different name. His theorem is that the problem of classifying closed four manifolds up to homeomorphisms is algorithmically unsolvable. So at first glance, it says we should give up. There's nothing we can say about four manifolds. But his proof was based on the unsolvability problem for groups generated by, presented by finitely many generators and relations. And it amounted to showing that if you could, if you could solve the homeomorphism problem for closed four manifolds, then you could solve the, solve the isomorphism problem for groups, which is known to be impossible. So the, the only moral you can get from this that is, if you want any chance of a reasonable theory, you have to start with manifolds with an explicit known fundamental group, an explicit description of the fundamental group. And in practice, most of the work has been concentrated on the case where the fundamental group is trivial. The trivial group is certainly very well known. Well, one important step towards understanding simply connected four manifolds was proved by Henry Whitehead actually a few years earlier. Uh, I've known many mathematicians, but he had a hobby that is unique as far as I know. He enjoyed raising pigs. <laughs> well, Whitehead wasn't interested in manifolds. What he, he was interested in finite complexes, but he get, classified simply connected four-dimensional complexes up to homotopy type. And, Given such a theorem, it's trivial to apply it to manifolds. So he showed that such a uh, complex, such a manifold, is uniquely determined 
up to homotopy type by its intersection form. If you take two middle dimensional homology classes and put them in general position, they'll intersect each other and you have a well-defined integer intersection number. And this gives you a symmetric bilinear unimodular determinant, a uh, unimodular form, the form meaning if you represent it by an n by n matrix, then the determinant is plus or minus one, and the matrix is symmetric. Here n is the middle Betty number. Well, this brings us to a very complicated problem in number theory. How do you classify such, uh, such symmetric bilinear forms? Uh, it turns out that in the indefinite case where the self intersection number can be either positive or negative, the classification is quite easy. But in the definite case, it's a horrendous problem. Now, this was studied by Carl Ludwig Siegel, and he gave a kind of asymptotic formula, which, which showing that the number of possibilities grows, grows very rapidly with a rank. And for example, for rank 30, there are at least 900 million distinct classes. Uh, the, 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 there's a description of the result in my book with Husemuller, not, not a proof, that, nothing like a proof, but in some reference to what, the, what his theorem said. Well, there was a dramatic improvement in 82 when Mike Friedman showed that any closed oriented four manifold is determined up to homeomorphism by its intersection form uh, together with one number modulo two, which is described as an obstruction to smoothability. So this, is, this other invariant is always zero in the smooth case. So in the smooth case, the intersection form is a complete invariant, not only for homotopy type, but also up for orientation preserving homeomorphism. And furthermore, he showed that any symmetric bilinear unimodular form can be realized by a topological manifold. So all of these cases can occur, although not always by a smoother piecewise linear manifold. Here's an example if you take a bilinear form described by this Dinkin diagram where each dot represents a basis vector with self-intersection number minus, uh, plus two and each edge represents a, a intersection number between these two basis vectors of plus one, then this is an example of a unimodular lattice of rank eight for which the kirby even invariant is always non-zero, so it can be represented by a topological manifold, but never by a smooth manifold. Well, this seemed to clear up the theory of four manifolds. Everything was known. There was nothing left to do until Donaldson, through a spanner in the works a few years later, by the following theorem. Suppose you have a smooth smooth closed four manifold, simply connected with positive definite intersection form. Then the form is diagonalizable. So it follows from Friedman that it's homeomorphic to a connected sum of copies of the complex projective plane. So as an example, suppose we look at these more than 900 million topological manifolds with positive definite intersection form of rank 30. Only one of these is represented by a smooth manifold. Well, so we had two, diff two different schools of mathematics working from completely different directions and getting very different results. Friedman was working from a wild, using completely non-smooth wild topological methods. Donaldson was using, considering smooth manifolds using meta ideas coming from gauge theory and mathematical physics. <clears throat> and if you combine the two methods, then you've got amazing results. For example, Taubes showed that putting the two methods together, you could prove that the Euclidean four space has uncountably many distinct differentiable structures. So nobody had 
ever produced an example before with more than uh, more than a finite number of differentiable structures, and suddenly you were getting uncountably many. And this is completely different from what happens in any other dimension. For all other dimensions, one knows that there's only one differentiable structure up to diffeomorphism on Euclidean space. So dimension four is really different from all other dimensions. And I'll just conclude with an open problem. The smooth analog of the Poincaré conjecture remains completely open in dimension four. So we don't know whether the smooth structure on the, oh, there's a little typo here. It, uh, for three, please read four. <laughs> Sorry about this. Aside from that, I think it's correct. <laughs> so for n greater than or equal to one, you can make the commutative semi-group just by using the connected sum operations on differential structures on the sphere. And for all other dimensions, this is a finite abelian group. In the case n equals three, this follows from Perelman's result, and Kervera and I proved it in higher dimensions. And this group can now be computed in dimensions other than four up to about 64. And in this range, only seven of these groups are trivial. All of the other ones are non-trivial. So it's a reasonable conjecture that, that, that it's non-trivial but in all but a finite number of cases. But in dimension four, nothing is known. Is it non-trivial? If it's non-trivial, is it at least a group? If so, how big a group? Is it finite, finitely generated? If it's not a group, there are all kinds of semigroups which could, could in principle occur. What kind of semigroup is it? And no one knows. And I'll stop there, uh, maybe with a few references. Thank you very much for a beautiful lecture. We are running a little bit late, so I think we will defer the uh, Q&A and you can ask Professor Milner in private afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>